think over the last two or three years, organizations have needed to lean more on their people than what they have previously. And as a result of that, uh, there was a opportunity, I think, for HR to get that seat at the boardroom table that we'd all talked about for such a long time. As a result of that, those CHROs or chief people officers who took up that mantle have played an incredibly important role for organisations in driving what I would consider to be a people first agenda and understanding that true competitive advantage for your organisation can come from having an engaged workforce who understands the, how the work that they do impacts on the overall success of the organisation, but how they the work that they do is connected to a, a greater purpose outside of just profit and performance. And lastly, I think those chief people officers or uh, chief human resources officers who uh, have managed to convince their boards or their organisations of having a people first strategy are seeing the results of that. At Randstad SourceRight, uh, I'm partnering with our Chief People Officer to drive a, a number of what I think are differentiating strategies in the market. Uh, first and foremost, we believe our people have a unique energy and drive uh, that's focused on really extracting a distinct talent advantage for all of the customers that we work with at the moment. Second to that, um, uh, we're really driving a collaborative, transparent communication culture where anyone within our organisation has a voice and that voice uh, we give uh, audience to to ensure that we're bringing into our overall fit to win strategy the feelings of our people who are with the coalface of our customers every day so that we can work in a more agile and customer centric way to change the way that we continue to run the company in the future. And I think lastly, we're also very focused on making sure that our employees' voices are heard externally in the market. And uh, that was rewarded more recently by being named a top 100 employer by Glassdoor. Um, and it's something that irrespective of that award, we're still productively paranoid about making a better place for our people to work every day. I think if we reflect back on the last couple of years, uh, there certainly has been some exceptional circumstances that organisations have had to deal with. Uh, we're one of them. And I think if we reflect on how people have felt during that time, a lot of them have felt uh, anxious, scared, and uncertain about what the future might mean for them in their current role and uh, what that will mean for their ability to provide for their, their loved ones, their family, etc. As a result of that, we as an organisation have focused really hard on recognising the individual nature of some of those situations um, and have significantly increased in the ability to customise the wellbeing packages that we have available for our employees. In addition to that, we've really doubled down on the amount of transparency and frequency of communication going out to our workforce so they understand what we're doing, why we're doing it, the part that they play in that and why they still have an incredible role here within our company to help impact on the world of work. And then lastly, uh, we've recognised that those exceptional circumstances uh, require an exceptional investment or an exceptional change in the way that we would typically uh, solve or proactively mitigate some of these issues. As a result of that, we've started ecosystems and partnerships with the companies like the Tent Partnership, in which we're actively allowing people to donate hours to helping the refugee situation in the Ukraine. Lots of our individuals within our organisation want to donate more hours to charity and as a result of that during the pandemic we've seen a significant increase in our employees' desire to want to lean in and help in those situations. And then lastly we've been flexible about where and when someone has had an exceptional circumstance that requires us as an organisation to get a little bit outside our comfort zone. Um, uh, we've leaned into that and as a result of that we've seen the benefit of a more engaged workforce that's prepared to deliver on the strategic initiatives we need to for our customers. When it comes to other CEOs and the initiatives that they're looking to take at the moment, I've seen a, a, a range of different uh, strategic uh, agenda items arise. Um, first and foremost, I think uh, the topic of diversity, equity, inclusion has been on the top of a lot of CEOs' mind and how do you execute a strategy on that that's genuine and authentic and, and feels right for your culture. One particular CEO we work with uh, has initiated a uh, bottom-up 
data-driven exercise to understand how and where they attract the most diverse and inclusive skill sets to particular roles within their organisation. Um, that allows them, and through our partnership, to see what does good look like in terms of a long list or a short list for a particular role that they're hiring for at the moment. And through that, they can then track the ethnicity, gender, age, sexual orientation, religion of individuals that are applying at that stage of a requisition and really drive a diverse and more inclusive uh, applicant flow of candidates throughout their requisition funnel to truly Im impact the bedrock of their organisation to be more diverse and inclusive. In addition to that, we've seen uh, lots of organisations really start to drive what I would consider to be larger strategic ecosystems that impact the world of work. So for example, one of the CEOs we're working with at the moment um, has pulled together an ecosystem of partners to tap into the vast amounts of individuals that are actually over-educated in Ethiopia at the moment. And uh, when we think about the growth that's happening within the technology and uh, digital skill sector at the moment and the vast skill shortages that exist, uh, we with a number of other CEOs are looking at hiring and training upwards of a million cloud engineers in Ethiopia over the next three to five years to fill some of the critical skills gap that exists at the same time we're also uh, leaning into the capability of building a burgeoning middle class within Ethiopia. From a, a human capital perspective over the next three to five years, I think uh, leaders need to be bold. It's the organisations that are, are led by leaders who are happy to take their chief people officer or their talent acquisition leader side by side with them over the journey of the next three to five years who I genuinely believe will be in a position to capitalise on some competitive advantage. In order to do that, uh, chief people officers and talent acquisition directors need to be three things. Firstly, they need to ensure that there's a people first agenda within the organisation. Um, uh, they need to connect that people first agenda to data. Um, uh, the, the ability to be able to make data-driven decisions on what are the skills that your workforce needs to acquire, what, how do you ensure that your employees are being heard and they feel uh, genuine and authentic about the people strategies that you're trying to execute. And then lastly, there needs to be an increased sense of flexibility. This idea that work can be done in any way, shape or form across any geography, across any industry is something that uh, Chief People Officers and Talent Acquisition Directors really need to champion. And by doing so, they'll increase the trust within their workforce and they'll get access to skills that they, they didn't think they would be able to get access to previously.